if you didn't notice, by the way, Article 1 is about half the size of the Constitution, isn't it? Or the original Constitution, I, sh I should say. It's, it's much less than half if you include the 27 amendments. But if you just take the Constitution as the Founding Fathers had written it during that summer of 1787, Article 1 is about half of the Constitution, right? That's a lot of material that we're going to cover. And we're not going to be able to go through everything. But we're going to get the key points, we hope. <clears throat> so, starting on page 1, um, <clears throat> Section 1 is a very tiny little section, right? Uh, and, and that basically outlines that the power has been vested into the legislature, okay? Then we're going to go down to number 2, section 2, okay? That's the House of Representatives, okay? Turn your page over to page number 2. Section 3 is the United States Senate, okay? Page 3, at the bottom, Section 4. This affirms that elections will be done by law. Page 5, page 4, Section 5. This section outlines the rules um, for the legislature, that there shall be journals kept, uh, and also even goes through the way to expel a member if, if that should occur. That, that happens very, very rarely, but it has happened. Page 5, Section 7. Section 7 goes through uh, <clears throat> the fact that any bills and any money that's to be raised by the government should happen through the legislature and it also goes through the whole process of a bill becoming a law. Okay? Then we come down to page six, section eight. We're gonna go, we're gonna spend more time in section eight than any other section, okay? Section eight explains what the government can and should do. What did you want to say? Oh, I was gonna say that they blame Good good job. A ticket for this camper, please. Okay, and section 9, section 9 explains the prohibitions on Congress. What can Congress not do? Okay, and section 10 explains prohibitions on the states. What can the states not do? Okay, so we're going to go through this article together. It's going to take us about 40 minutes, 40 more minutes, and we're going to begin with the first word, section one, no, oh, excuse me, article one, say it with me. Article one, section one, clause one, sentence one, word one. The first word is all. Say all. All. Let's read this together. All, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Okay. And this, incidentally, if you did not know, is John F. McManus's favorite sentence in the Constitution. Okay, let's talk about this for a moment. All legislative powers. What does it mean to be a legislative power? Yes? Um, is it like the Senate? Uh, no, but good try. So let's give this camper a ticket because that was good. good. See, it's, it's, it's okay to be wrong. It's better to try and be wrong than to not try. Yes? Yes. Say that louder. So she said laws. A ticket for this camper, too. Um, <clears throat> all legislative powers means all law power or law making power. All the power of law. Okay? That's what that means. Okay. So, 
Herein granted. What does herein granted mean? Um, basically means that they are giving all of the lawmaking power of the United States to a certain, um, um, a certain area of the government and nothing else. Bingo. Uh, ticket for this camper too, uh, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> so all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested. What does it mean to be vested? Yes. Grounded in something important? Yes, yes. Grounded in something, placed into something. That's right. And it is placed into, what's the next word? In a? Con Congress. Congress. Everybody say that. Congress. Congress of the United States. And the Congress of the United States shall consist of, go ahead, read it. It's in your books. Bingo. Okay. So, so let's go back and do this one more time. This is Article One, Section One, Clause One, Sentence One, and we're going to read it together one more time. Everybody. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Constitu Con Congress of the United States which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Okay. So from this point forward, we are going to skip forward a few pages and we are going to go to um, page six. No. Yeah, six. That's right. One section eight. Okay, section eight. <clears throat> uh, I'll read it first, and then we're going to go back back through this together. It says, "The Congress shall have the power to, beginning in section eight. Okay, Congress shall have the power to, and then it goes through, and it has, it, it actually has eighteen clauses in this section. Okay, um, it's easier for me uh, to to go through this because I've numbered every clause." in my booklet. And if you want to do that, that's not a bad idea. You might not want to do it now, or maybe you want to do it now, or you could do it later, but it's really good and helpful to have these these clauses numbered so that you have, so that you can refer to them quickly. Um, but that's, <clears throat> that's what we're talking about here. Congress shall have the power to. And then it goes through and it explains the enumerated powers that the Founding Fathers gave Congress. What does it mean to be an enumerated power? Yes? Exclusive? Say again. Exclusive? Exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, literally listed or numbered. Yeah. But yes, that's that's good. Uh, ticket, another ticket for Gabriella, please. Okay. <clears throat> So we're going to go through some of these together. We'll start at section 8, sentence clause 1, section 1. Let's read it together. Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Okay, so Congress is can, can tax, okay? But Congress cannot tax Ohio greater than it can tax Florida, right? Okay, <clears throat> number two. To borrow, borrow money, money on the credit of the, of the United States. States. Okay. So Congress, or the legislature, can borrow money. Number three, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Okay. Number four, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Now this is this is really interesting, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> if 
a company should go bankrupt in New Hampshire, the laws for that company are exactly the same as if that company had gone bankrupt in Connecticut. Right? States cannot have differing laws on that topic. Yes, what do you want to say? Um, are, uh, the, about the Indian tribes, is that so relevant? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. But let's give this camper a ticket. We'll find out the question for that. This is, oh, Mr. Moore, down. can you write that down? Because yeah. we'll find out the answer to that and get, get the answer to him before the end of the week. Okay? But what is, <clears throat> what is not consistent is that Congress is making laws in all sorts of other areas where it does not have authority and and yet here's here's a place where it does have authority on subject of bankruptcies. Okay, now number 5, let's do this one together. To coin, <clears throat> to coin money and regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. Stop. Okay. So, Congress has the authority to coin money. Who handles our money today? Uh, I, I should have phrased that differently. Who, who, um, who prints our money today? Well, it's actually, it's the um, the Bureau of en of Engraving, uh, but. The Federal Reserve is the one that, that handles it when it, it comes in and out of the Bureau of Engraving, the Federal Reserve System, okay? Who knows how the Federal Reserve System came about? Something the Wasn't it meant to be a national bank? Yes, and it was created over a hundred years ago now, it was about a hundred and four years ago, okay? And what Congress did was Congress, which has the authority to coin money, Congress turned over that power to a private bank, which has uh, shareholders that, that are not known, okay? And uh, this, this was basically Congress turning over its its own authority, uh, and and that's not right because the Constitution, the founding fathers wanted Congress to have this power. Now let's look even more closely at at this clause. It says, it says to coin money, right? Does it say to print money? No. No. Okay, but what what do we have, uh, Mr. Moore? Do you have? Oh, thank you. Oh, you're so wonderful. Yeah. Coin money. Right. So this is actually. This is a $20 bill. It's a Federal Reserve note. Um, this is lawful coined money. This is a coined $20 gold piece from before the Federal Reserve. Mm. Guess which one might be worth a little more? Anybody? Yeah. A coin. So gold. it shows why we should have stuck with this system, right? This is not worth nearly as much as it used to be. Thank you, Mr. Moore. <clears throat> What the Federal Reserve System can do is, while you sleep, the Federal Reserve System can print money overnight, okay, and actually can create it electronically as well, all right, which causes the value of the money that you have, of the Federal Reserve notes that you have, to decrease. So it's a way they can steal from you even when you're sleeping in your bed at night, all right? And that's this is this is a key clause in Article One in the whole Constitution, really. And there there have been bills in Congress over the years to uh, rescind the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, or or even just to audit the Federal Reserve System. Okay, has the Federal Reserve System ever been audited? No, not in 104 years. But your parents have probably been audited from time to time. Okay. <clears throat> Number six. 
Let's read this together. To provide for punishment of counterfeiting the securities and the current coin of the United States. Okay? Congress can do that. Number seven, to establish post offices and post roads. Okay? Post offices, post roads, A okay. Number eight, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Who? Yes. That is a very good question. Um, I, you know, I, Mr. Moore, question is why are some words capitalized and other words not capitalized? I believe that may have been done for emphasis. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, may I answer? Mrs. Harper. Uh, it was customary in both Germany and England for a long time to capitalize all nouns. Um, those of you who studied grammar have probably learned that we have proper nouns, so we capitalize names and titles, but we don't routinely capitalize every noun. If we say the cat, we don't capitalize cat. But in those days, they did. Now, I noticed an anomaly in here in the post offices, they treat it as a name and capitalize post as well, which is really an adjective modifying offices. In, in, in the German language, all nouns are, are capitalized to this day. I, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly uh, why that was done um, in, in every particular case. And I've actually wondered the same thing as I've read through both the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, why certain words were, were chosen to be capitalized. You know, because they obviously did, did not capitalize every noun, but yet some, some were. Okay, so let's, oh, okay, so we're on number eight. Okay, we're on number eight. It says um, the exclusive right for the respective writings and discoveries. That today is. Does anybody know what office that falls under today? Yes. Copyright. Copyright offices. Copyrights and patents. Okay. Um, ticket for that camper, please. It's the copyright and patent and trademark office. Is that the proper name for it? Okay. Copyright, trademark, and, and patent office. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Number nine. Together. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Okay. Number ten. To define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. Okay. Uh, number 11, to, to declare, declare war, war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Okay. All right. Congress has the responsibility of declaring war. Who has declared war most of the time for the last about 60, 70 years? Yes. The UN. Uh, the UN has actually uh, issued pro proclamations of war. Yes, yes. And who else? The executive branch. The executive branch has as well. Yep. Tickets for those campers, please. Um, <clears throat> so war, war since World War II. World War II was the last time that this country declared war properly, and Congress voted and declared war. Okay, declared war against Japan, against Germany, uh, against couple other countries, I think Austro-Hungary Empire, uh, and that was all proper and good. After that, beginning with the Korean conflict, uh, it was done in other ways. Th this, is, this is really important because the founding fathers did not want a king or one man or one potentate to have the power to send other people away to their death. So Congress very specifically, it's written right here, Congress was given the power to declare war and then, only then, did the President become the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. If, if the country is not at war, it's really not accurate to call the President the Commander-in-Chief. 
That's a wartime expression. Okay. Uh, what is a letter of mark and reprisal? Does anyone know? Ah, Andrew. Um, a letter of mark, I believe, is um, a license to kill. It is. Um, well, it, uh, that may have been part of it. Uh, my understanding of it is that it was uh, an authorization to to uh, to to do something at sea that would otherwise be, be illegal. In, in other words, allowing a private, a private vessel owned by an American to do something that, <clears throat> that normally only a military ship would do if, if it were encountering hostile vessels from another country. Okay, so I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong. Uh, that's not my understanding of it, but now we all know exactly what a letter of mark and reprisal is all about. Okay, number 12. A ticket for that camper, please. Okay, <clears throat> let's do this one together. To raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be longer for term than two years. Okay, and number 13. To provide and maintain a navy. The Founding Fathers viewed America as a place that was vulnerable generally from the seas. And so the Navy was created and to be maintained continuously, okay? But the Army, because armies can, are, are more easily misused, the army was not to exist for really more than a term of two years. And that's, that's something that we really don't do that properly. Uh, if we're going to maintain an army continuously, it should, it should be up for renewal. Um, but, but they don't do that. Okay, number 14. To make rules for government and regulation of the land and naval forces. Okay, and the reason for that is so that South Carolina doesn't have rules coming in to its shores that New York does not honor. Or Massachusetts doesn't have rules that it can impose on ships from Rhode Island, okay? Okay, where were we? Number? To provide for Colin Forth. Number 15, okay, let's do number 15 together. To provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, okay? Uh, this is very similar to Article 4, Section 4, where it talks about uh, protecting the borders uh, against invasion. Okay, this, this talks about suppressing insurrection and repelling an invasion. Number 16, let's do it together. Oh, hold, hold, hold on. Yes. Say again. What would the militia count as for today? Today, there really isn't a militia. A militia way back, like in the 1770s, okay, and for many years before that, was just mostly the local men of a community that would, that would be armed, practice together from time to time, and be available and ready in case they needed to protect their town or community. And there really isn't a similar thing like that now. Yeah. Okay, yes? Say that I'm not sure about that. Okay, so tickets for, for these two campers, please. Okay, so back to uh, where were we? Number 16, right? Yeah, well, that's right. You, you don't have the numbers in your stuff, do you? Okay. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of the training of the militia according to discipline prescribed by Congress. Okay, so Congress could prescribe a discipline or a method, if you will, uh, as, as to how the militia was, was trained. Number 17, <clears throat> to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may by session of particular states 
and acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States. Stop. What are the Founding Fathers talking about right here? Someone take a guess. Yes? I think they're talking about all court cases. I'm, I'm asking about the uh, where it talks about the 10 miles square to be the seat of government. Yes? Say it so everyone can hear it. Ticket for that camper, please. We're talking about Washington, D.C., what later became, because it didn't exist when this was written, but it was created and became Washington, D.C., the, the seat of government. Okay, okay so let's pick up um, midway right through that Clause 17, and starting with and two. Like authority, authority over, over all, all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Okay. Okay. And. Yeah, and. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, number 18 is uh, Mr. McManus one time gave a speech of, um, I think it was titled, uh, Misunderstood. Phrases in the Constitution, and he had four of them. This was one of the four. Okay, number eighteen. We're going to go through this. We're going to go through this twice. Okay, let's let's say it together. We'll we'll all say the whole thing together, and then we'll go back through it. Number eighteen, the last clause in section eight. And to make, to make all laws, laws which, which shall be necessary, necessary and proper for carrying into execution, execution the foregoing powers. powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Campers, this is one of the most important clauses that you are learning all week. Pay careful attention to this. <clears throat> Congress was to make laws which Congress felt were necessary and proper for carrying out or executing the foregoing powers. Say that. The foregoing, foregoing powers. powers. What are the foregoing powers? Yes. The ones already stated in Article 1. The ones already stated in 1. The powers that we've just gone through. So if Congress deems it necessary to tell you what type of toilet paper to use because they think they know better, is that, and they say if Congress says it's necessary and proper, is it constitutional? No. I can't hear you. No. no. Right. It's not. And the reason for that is because this document doesn't give Congress authority over toilet paper, right? If Congress thinks it's so important that you eat dinner at 5 o'clock every night, can Congress make a law telling you every American must have dinner at 5 o'clock at night? Can they do that? No. No. Because dinner is not mentioned in here. Yes? How about aircraft? There should be some laws involving aircraft, like uh, what happens with ships. Uh, I'm not sure that I understand the question exactly. Um, since aircraft weren't around, then they couldn't talk about regulating them. But they, they need similar regulations to the ships. So do the ships' laws carry over, or Pro probably they do. That that's probably a legitimate um, expansion of that of that power from to include from ships to, to aircraft, because you're right, aircraft did not exist at that time. Good good thought. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government. Okay? So it's basically the powers listed here 
and any other powers, and they are sprinkled throughout the Constitution. You know, for example, Article 4, Section 4 explains that Congress should protect the borders, right? That's, that's, that's in there, and there's, there's other powers from time to time. So, <clears throat> so, so Congress has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary, they feel should be necessary and proper, carrying into execution the foregoing powers, the powers just mentioned, and all other powers vested in this Constitution, okay, or in any department or officer thereof, okay. Congress has gotten into all sorts of things it should not, not get into, okay. And, and uh, Congressman Ron Paul one time uh, <clears throat> asked um, one of his colleagues, he was in Congress at the time, he said to one of his colleagues, where in the Constitution is it authorized that we, that we do whatever it was that they were doing at the time? And the congressman's response was, well, we think it's necessary and proper. Okay? It's, this is one of the, the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, overlooked, and abused parts of our entire Constitution. Okay, so we're going to move on to Section 9. Section 9, okay? Uh, turn over to page 8, please. The, <clears throat> let's start at the top and we're going to say it together. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. Okay? No, oh, we're going to. Yeah, yeah. Um, it actually started on page 7. Well, we're not covering every word. We don't have enough time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, next, next clause, starting no bill of attainder. Okay? No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. What is an ex post facto law? Who knows what? It, who wants to take a guess? It's okay to guess and be wrong. Devin. Okay, so X is most likely meaning after the fact. Post facto oh, is more is is like the like after the normalcy. Right. That's that's right. <clears throat> an ex <clears throat> an ex post facto law is, for example, um, we pass a law here at Camp Constitution that you cannot have these constitutions with you here at class and if you come to class with a constitution you don't get dinner okay uh, and look you all have constitutions therefore none of you have dinner none of you get dinner right okay but that can't be done because if we make that law now you brought your constitutions with you already we cannot fine you or penalize you after the fact okay that's an ex post facto law all right um, what is a bill of attainder? Yes. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Okay. Does anybody want to take a guess on what a bill of attainder is? This is something that the founding fathers were, were greatly astute at putting into the Constitution. The reason you don't know about it is because we don't have these uh, the way they used to in, in, in other countries and, and still do. A bill of attainder is an act of a legislator, is an act that a legislator, a legislature passes to punish a person without trial by jury. Okay? Okay. Next clause. No, no cap capitation. we'll do it together. Everyone together. Okay. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before direction to, to be taken. Okay. Um, what is a capitation? Who was the camper that was standing up here with the, the guillotine yesterday? What? Jacob? Yeah. What is a is a capitation? What Jacob almost suffered yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Andrew. Well, that would be a decapitation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
like yeah. It, it, is a, it is a direct tax or a poll tax, okay? It's a tax, okay? All right, so uh, next, next clause. Oh, oh, actually, um, in proportion to the census, okay. Um, <clears throat> what is the census? Um, yes. The counting of people. The counting of the people, correct. Ticket for that camper, please. All right. <clears throat> Is a census a legitimate act of the government? Yes, it is. That's right. It is important for the government to know how many people are in a state so that the government can tell, uh, can, um, <clears throat> can determine how many members of Congress to put in that state. So that is a legitimate function of government. Um, is a census a new thing? Is that something that started with the United States? I see a, a, a head waving no. Why? What happened? Well, it happened in biblical times. Right. That's right. Why, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because of the census. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph had to take Mary back to Bethlehem because that's where his family was from. So they had to be counted in Bethlehem. All right. <clears throat> next, next line, starting with no tax or duty. <clears throat> no tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go down to two paragraphs above section ten. It starts with no money shall be drawn. No money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriation made by law, and a regular statement and account of receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. So the American people should know where their money is, is going. Okay. Okay, this is... Um, this is uh, an interesting one here. The last one in section nine. No, no we'll do it together. No, no title of no nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. Okay. Um, the previous president, this was about eight years ago because he was just president only a couple of months, as I recall, accepted a, a Nobel Prize and went to, I believe it was Sweden, Sweden or so, someplace in Europe. Um, Norway. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and that was really a foreign, yes, yes it was really a violation of, of, this, of this Constitution, yes. So let's say um, some, uh, a member of the British royal family is moving to America for some reason and eventually joins Congress. Let's say his brother decides to give him a present for a ride of Christmas. Would that count as there? Who, whose brother? The, uh, the British royal family member would be to join Congress. Have to be a citizen to join to get elected to Congress. Yeah, it'd have to be a citizen, yeah. number one. It's a good question. Let's let's look at this carefully here. Uh, uh, he could do it with the consent of Congress. It says right here, Congress would have to consent to that. So otherwise, he couldn't do it. Yes. So. If you're on the House of Representatives and you had a um, and then you had a baby family and some distant relative died and they happened to be in some royal family somewhere and they're, they're, they had no little so their inheritance got to be would you be able to take that? 
If somebody in a foreign country died and left me a fortune, Andrew, I would take it. <laughs> but the answer is they could not uh, hold a foreign title and hold a, a position of government right. as well, simultaneously. Okay? All right, section 10. This is exciting here. Okay, this tells us, this tells us what, what the states cannot do, okay? It, um, Article 1, Section 8 basically tells us what, what the legislature can do, and here many of the, the things that, that came from Section 8, which the legislature can do, the states are being told, no, you cannot do. These are federal responsibilities. These are, these are spheres of the federal government, not of state government, because remember, uh, if we turn over to um, uh, the Bill of Rights here, page um, 23, okay, what does amendment number 10 say? We're looking at almost to the bottom of, of 23. We're going to go back here, okay? Everybody there? Yeah. I'm there. Okay, if you're there, let's read number, it says amendment X, that's 10, okay? We're going to read that together, okay? The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Okay? So here, here's what's going on. The, the Founding Fathers basically outlined in, in Section 8 most of the responsibilities of the legislature, okay, and now it's coming back and saying, and, 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 and the, the Founding Fathers basically said, look, unless, unless we delegated it to the federal government, it's otherwise therefore a state power. So state power, states have power over everything, okay, except for those things that we enumerate uh, in, in Article 1, Section 8. But, now the Founding Fathers are coming back and saying, ah, states, these things you cannot do. Okay, so let's go, actually we only have just a couple minutes here. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I lost my place here. Okay, uh, section 10. Uh, page 8, section 10. Let's read it together. No, no state, state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. Stop. Okay, so a state cannot make a treaty with England or France or Spain, right? But the federal government can do that, right? Okay, uh, next. Grant letters of mark and reprisal. Stop. Remember, that was one of the, the authorities that was given to Congress. So therefore, states cannot do it. Okay, uh, coin money. Stop. The federal, the, the founding fathers did not want states having competing currencies with one another. Um, that's a actually something that, that we obey today, uh, but we don't obey Section 8, Clause 5, unfortunately, which is one of the worst things that, that we don't do. Okay. Let's go back. Emit bills, Emit bills of, credit. of credit. Make, Make anything, anything but gold and silver. silver coin and tender payment of debts. Yes. Pass yes. any yes. bill of attainder yes. or ex post facto yes. law or law yes. impairing the obligation of contracts or grant any title of nobility. Okay. All right. Um, clause two. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws and the net produce of all duties imposts laid by any state on imports and exports. Stop. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a lot more, I don't, we only have two minutes left. We did this deliberately, there's a lot in in Article One that we did not cover, okay? We did not go through um, Section Two. We did not go through Section Three. These things you can go back and read on your own. It's it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, it, it goes through the rules of the House. 
It talks about how, how old you have to be to serve as a member of the House, how many years you have to be a citizen of the United States. It talks about the same thing for the Senate. You have to be 30 years old. You have to be 13 years a, a, a citizen of the United States. Um, and I would encourage you to, to go back and, and read the, the rest of the, uh, the article. There's so much to the Constitution. I'm going to offer a challenge. If anybody wants to take me up on this, I would love to know if Article 1 is more or less than half of the original Constitution. Right? And somebody would have to count it out word by word. Somebody might be able to know how to do that with a computer today. I don't. But uh, that is a challenge, and anybody that that wants to do that will will come up with some type of price. Yes. So I could use the computer in the newspaper office. I could do it fast. Okay. Well, talk with Mr. Affleck, and he will he will um, see if if he can get you that privilege. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are there any last questions before we before we go to the the break? Thank you all for your great attention. Learn more about Article 1. Have a great rest of the day.